All right. Hello and welcome to lesson five of this free online ichthyology course. Today we're going to be talking about locomotion, which is, if you don't know how fish move, uh, why fish are shaped the way that they are, why fins exist and they're shaped the way that they are, some ways that we can compare the movement of fishes uh, and determine what's more efficient, less efficient, uh, or more reasonably what's adapted for what situations versus other situations. Now, this should be less intense than the last lesson, uh, content-wise. Uh, external and internal anatomy, there's a lot to go over. Locomotion, as a general concept, is not terribly difficult. Uh, the only thing about locomotion that tends to throw people off is that it involves math. Uh, you'll notice just by these images that I have on the title slide here, some, some axes and some variables being displayed, which is not something we're used to looking at when we talk about studying fish. So for some people, this might be more intense uh, than previous lectures, which were longer, more content filled because it contains math. And I'll admit, I'm not exactly uh, the most mathematically inclined person myself. I'm pretty math averse as far as that goes. So for me as well, this is a, a somewhat difficult concept and not one that I would say I have the full in-depth grasp of. Uh, so if you want to go more in depth than just the basics of fish locomotion, uh, I, I recommend reading further. Uh, but today we're just going to talk about the general of why fish are shaped the way that they are, why it's efficient, uh, and compare different types of locomotion, and then where we see examples of them. So the first thing to talk about is the environment that we are living in as a fish. Uh, so fish live in water. We talked about that as one of the requirements of being a fish is that they are aquatic. Uh, and water is about 50 times more viscous, as you'll see by this chart here, than air, which essentially means 50 times more thick. So it is 50 times harder to move through water than it is to move through air, right? So if you were a human and you were theoretically standing in water with the same gravity and you wanted to move at the same speed as say you can run, you would need to be 50 times stronger essentially to move at the same speed um, because the substance that you're moving through, water rather than air, is 50 times thicker. It's 50 times more viscous. So because of this, Fish are going to have specialized structures. Specialized structures are fins, um, scoots, other various adaptations that allow them to move through this highly viscous water. Uh, and there are lots of different ways to go about that, but that is basically why specialized structures are necessary because it is difficult to move through water more so than through air. On air, you're going to get, you know, on land in the air, you're going to get a lot more differentiation of what things look like. Things can look very diverse in like how they walk, how they move, how they're shaped, like the efficiency of their limbs and all that when you talk about things on land. In the water, fins are pretty much a necessity for anything that's going to be moving or anything that's living in open water and intends to have any control over its location. Uh, these specialized structures are necessary to have any control because it is so much harder. There's such a higher energy requirement to move through water than through air. So the first thing to talk about is why water presents a challenge. Um, and this isn't uh, simply only a water thing. Air will present similar challenges, just not to the same degree. Uh, and it is that there are two different types of drag uh, forces, uh, which are forces that act against what you are intending to do. So if you're a fish and you're swimming, you're moving your fins, you're intending to move forward. And there are two different forces that will act against you. And knowing the distinction between them is important because it determines why fish are shaped the way that they are and why fish move the way that they do. So the first one is called viscous drag. It is friction, essentially. It is the friction between the fish's body and the water. And it forces smooth bodies with a streamlined shape. So think about if you try to roll a ball on the ground, uh, the ball will eventually stop moving because it has some force of friction with the ground. On ice, it'll move a little bit longer. On grass, it won't roll as far because grass has a higher friction value than ice does. So in the water, the same thing applies. The friction between the fish's body and the friction between the water is going to create a force against the direction where the fish is moving. Uh, and you can see by these diagrams that spherical shapes are about the midway. These airfoil shapes, which is like what you think of when you think of like airplane wings, and fish are essentially just this shape, but tilted upwards. Uh, that is one of like the most efficient ways to deal with viscous drag force. And if you were theoretically were to just be a square, just a block moving through the water, uh, you would be generating a lot of viscous drag, a lot of frictional drag, because you have a large surface area of which the water is passing by. And then the other force, uh, which is somewhat related, but a different force entirely, 
is called pressure drag. And this is the difference in pressure when water is displaced. Uh, so you'll notice that you will have high pressure in front of the object or the fish as it moves through the water. And once it passes along and the water is flowing here, in the area behind the fish, there is not as much water flowing through it. It's lower pressure at that moment. And that difference in pressure is going to create a force which acts against the fish, all right? So don't worry too much about the details of that. But basically, the idea is you want to not leave such a gap in water behind you or it's going to create a pressure gradient that will create force against you. So you want a streamlined body shape. You want a thin, long body shape, to move fast at least, uh, so that the water pressure difference is not acting against you, right? You don't want a very high pressure in front of you and a very, high, uh, very low pressure behind you. That's just the general idea. Uh, and through both of these different types of viscous drag that you're dealing with, it should immediately become obvious why fast swimming fish are shaped, you know, like this, what we call streamlined, uh, because it's going to reduce viscous drag and it's going to reduce pressure drag so instantly you're talking about using less energy to move faster through the water and you're talking about how advantageous that is so the first mathematical thing that we're going to talk about is reynolds number so reynolds number is essentially an equation uh, and we can use it to predict how water will flow past a certain surface uh, so generally we'll use it for the the whole fish or the fins of the fish uh, and the way that water can flow is either laminar or turbulent, all right? And this relates to these drag forces that we talked about. Laminar flow is when the water flows by very nicely, very straight, stays organized. Turbulent flow is when the water sort of collapses in on itself, right? So if you want to expend less energy, if you're a fish, and ideally you always want to expend less energy to swim because it's already hard enough to swim, why make it harder on yourself? You want laminar flow to be going along your body, not turbulent flow. Because if you're creating all that turbulence behind you, you're creating that pressure gradient, you're creating a greater friction. So you're increasing those drag forces and costing yourself more energy to swim. So how do you get a laminar flow to move by your body? Uh, and that is what Reynolds number uh, helps us determine. So the Reynolds number equation is RE, which is Reynolds number, equals VL divided by V. All right, so broken down, that's Reynolds number which is the number that we arrive at and how we determine essentially the efficiency, which we'll talk about. Uh, it is equal to the velocity of the substance as it moves past. So, you know, the velocity of the water, the velocity of the fish times the length of the object moving. So the length of the object of the fish that is actually hitting the water as it comes to the front divided by the viscosity of the substance. So different water will have different viscosity, but it's also important to uh, include that because, you know, you could talk, a bit, talk about something moving through a more thick substance or a less thick substance, and that would affect the Reynolds number. So you can see sort of like a graph here uh, of the Reynolds number of different objects from, you know, straight up aircraft to all the way down to insects, birds, doves, things that are moving through substances and need to be concerned about the flow as it passes them because airflow applies in very similar ways with laminar and turbulent airflow. When you fly an airplane, you do not want turbulent flow behind your wings because it's going to not only make the flight more turbulent for the passengers, but it's also going to create a gradient, a pressure gradient that is going to make it harder and cost you more fuel and energy to fly the airplane. So you can calculate Reynolds number for the body of a fish, just a singular fin. You can calculate it for birds. You can talk about, calculate it for airplanes. It's useful for a variety of situations, but we're talking about it with fish. And normally we calculate it for the fish as a whole, but sometimes for particular fins. Um, and so basically it will indicate whether you're creating a laminar flow or a turbulent flow as the water flows past that area. So a low Reynolds number essentially indicates that laminar flow is being created. So the flow is moving nicely past that, that surface that you're calculating. Whereas if you get a high Reynolds number, uh, that would indicate that there's going to be some turbulent flow. And depending on how high it is versus how low it is, uh, will determine how much laminar flow versus how much turbulent flow. So to look at an example, I created a beautiful drawing here. Um, this is my patented diamond fish versus my patented uh, kind of box fish, right? So it all comes back to the forces of drag. So creating a turbulent flow along your body will lead to increased drag, meaning you have to use more, more energy to swim. So you wanna limit these forces of drag. You wanna limit your turbulent flow. You wanna have a laminar flow with very little drag. So fish are gonna want these body shapes and these fin shapes with low Reynolds numbers to reduce drag, if they're trying to go fast, obviously, right? So, in this example, 
uh, I thought it was on the next slide. In this example, if both fish are moving at four miles uh, meters per second, for example, so we know that the velocity is stable here, all right, and they're moving right next to each other, so they're moving in the same substance, right? So the viscosity is the same. So if this is the same and this is the same, then the only value that's changing, because remember Reynolds number is the resulting value, the only number that's changing that is variable is the length, which is the length of the fish that is actually hitting the water. And you'll notice on a, you know, my patented diamond fish, it'll be very short. Just this little nose is hitting the water, whereas on the box fish, it's uh, going to be a very large surface here. So you're going to get, because this is the top number in the equation, you're going to get a larger Reynolds number for this guy than you are for this guy. So this guy's going to have a low Reynolds number, which remember means more laminar flow, which means he's using less energy to swim at this speed. Whereas this guy at the same speed is going to have a higher Reynolds number, more drag, and need to use more energy to swim. So now let's talk about the ways that fish swim uh, and the ways that they are adapted to swim. And these are the types of caudal fins. So when we talked about external anatomy, we talked about the basic shapes of caudal fins. Um, so now we're going to talk about the actual anatomy. So when we talk about it, we're talking about mixture of external, ex you know, external appearance, how they actually look, um, but more so and often uh, the morphology of the vertebra inside them because that matters. If your spine goes all the way out to your tail, to the end of your tail, you have more control over that tail and you can use it to push through the water faster, harder, you know, with more strength. Whereas if your vertebra stops here, but your tail comes all the way out to here, this is essentially just a little flappy bit at the end of the tail uh, and you can't put much strength or force into that. So determining where the vertebra goes is actually very important beyond just looking at the tail from the outside. So the first type is protocircle, which is called primitive, undifferentiated. Uh, the vertebra comes all the way out to the tip, all right? And it's completely lateral. So it, the vertebra just goes straight out to the tip in a straight line. It's not tipping up, it's not tipping down. And this is the kind of thing that you'll see in lampreys and hagfish. And then this is actually shows up again way later down the line, you know, the evolutionary line uh, in some of the advanced teleos, so some of the euteleos, the more advanced fish that we talked about uh, in their larva. So their larva will have this type of tail when they're young. And then you have leptocircle. Uh, and leptocircle is similar to protocircle uh, in that the vertebra will extend all the way to the end of the tail fin. However, in leptocircle, there is a clear extension of the body into a tail. So if we look at protocircle, we're gonna see that the tail kind of just exists, right? The body just kind of comes out into a point and that's it. Whereas when we look at leptocircle, we're gonna see the body clearly ends here and then there's an extension, you know? The tail is its own separate extension of the body. So it's found convergently in a variety of fishes. So it's evolved convergently, which means that it is not an ancestral trait. Because there was not you know, necessarily a uh, particular ancestral fish that had a leptocircle tail, and then a bunch of fish came from that that also had leptocircle tails. Convergently evolved means that some fish had similar pressures, similar situations, similar environments, uh, and they uh, adapted this, evolved this on their own. So coelacanths, lungfishes, ratfishes, which is the holocephaly, uh, and then many eel-like fishes have this as well. Next one is heterocircle, and this is something we see mostly in modern sharks, and then in some of like the more primitive bony fishes that have you know re-evolved that cartilaginous, like the sturgeons, for example. Uh, so in heterocircle, the tail is split into two. So that's the first time we're seeing that the tail is split uh, horizontally. You know, there's a vertical, there's a top part and a lower part of the tail. Uh, and they're asymmetrical. That's what the hetero means. Uh, the two sides are not the same. And the vertebra can expand into just one of the lobes. So your spine can't split. Um, your spine can't go like up and down. Uh, I can't exactly tell you why, but your spine does not split that way. And fish spines don't split that way either. So the spine either has to go up until the top lobe of the tail or into the bottom lobe of a heterocircle tail. And whichever part that the spine goes into, remember I said there's going to be able to, the ability to move that. You know, the muscle's going to be connected to the spine there. You're not just having a flappy fin. You're going to have strength there. So sharks and these primitive fishes like sturgeon have the top part of their tail supported by vertebra, which creates a muscular system for their tail. You know, the muscle is attached to this vertebra, making it much, much stronger. So this design creates lift by having the top part of your tail very strong and able to move a little bit higher than your body. So when you're pushing the water to the side, you're pushing it a little bit above your body and then you have a flappy part underneath 
you know, a less strong, less supported part underneath, which is interacting with that water as you push it, it creates lift, which essentially means, you know, the fish is lifting itself up as it swims. And when you think about it, it actually makes sense because you think, okay, what, what fish have this? Oh, sharks. And why might sharks need lift? You know, why would sharks be lifting themselves? Well, remember, we talked about sharks don't have swim bladders. They have oily livers, which they use to, cre you know, control their buoyancy, which is, of course, not the same adaptability as a swim bladder. Swim bladders are much more adaptable, much more diverse than an oily liver is. So sharks having a tail that allows them to create lift so that they can, you know, lift themselves as they swim and not sink makes a lot of sense. And then we have homo circle, which, you know, homo, the Latin root means the same. So homo circle tails are symmetrical on the outside. Um, so they are most of the tails that we looked at when we talked about the caudal fin shapes. You know, we talked about the lunate and the truncate and the emarginate, and those are all mostly homo circle tails. Um, but internally, they are actually asymmetrical to some degree. So they create thrust without creating lift. Uh, so this is, you're going to find these in fish that have swim bladders most of the time uh, because they are not intended to create lift. The two sides of the tail are equal in value. So they're going to thrust the fish along just in the same way that the heterocircle is used to thrust the fish along. But because it's not even, they're not creating lift, right? So they're letting the swim bladder do their work as far as lift goes um, without you know, sacrificing the ability to thrust. So you're going to find this in fast moving fish generally um, that have a swim bladder. So now let's take a quick break, talk about the optimal fish. Now that we've talked about the things that they're dealing with, the drag forces, all these like optimal fin shapes, uh, the optimal fish, uh, we can actually determine it. We can determine what is the optimal perfect body shape formation makeup, which would use the absolute least amount of energy to swim at a certain speed. Uh, so to swim at fast speeds, we can determine what is the perfect body shape. Um, and this is, this is a pretty interesting thing to look at because this is how we design stuff. Like if we want to design a fast moving, you know, underwater submersible, we're going to design it with this in mind, this optimal fish. And when we design something like a fast moving, you know, missile through the air, we're going to design it like the optimal bird per se. Uh, we're going to use these physics concepts that we just talked about and apply them to come up with the absolute most efficient that we can be. Uh, so luckily we don't actually have to do the math because someone else has already done the math for us as far as what is optimal. Uh, and what's been determined is that the optimal width to length ratio of the body of a fish is 0.25 to 1. So the fish should be four times as long as it is wide. And the thickest portion of the body should be two-fifths of the way from the front. So it looks something like this picture on the left. The body is about four times as long as it is wide. And the very thickest part, though it's a little further ahead on, on this image, the very thickest part should be about two-fifths of the way down. So a little before halfway down the fish from the front. And that is considered the optimal fish. That would be the perfect, most efficient way to move through water using the least energy. And the crazy thing is that there are some fish that get impressively close to these ratios. So some examples are tuna and swordfish, which get extremely close. I mean, tuna is within like fractions, like tenths of a uh, tenths of the ratio, essentially of having the perfect ratio of width to length with the thickest part being you can see about two-fifths of the way down uh, so it's really cool because it shows us that even though you know nature isn't computing these things nature isn't like ah yes the optimal width to length ratio uh, even though nature doesn't know and the fish don't know the way that evolution works is that as forms change slightly if a change happens to be slightly more energy efficient then that fish is going to survive slightly better and over a long period of time as evolution takes place slowly as it does you're going to get to for these fish that intend to move fast and use that as their adaptation, these fish are going to be slowly, slowly approaching that perfect physiological state that we can now calculate and determine, but they're doing it on their own without being able to calculate it by pure accident because evolution and mutations are just selecting for the ability to move faster with, slow, or with less energy. So it's really cool that evolution will rest on what's optimal even without necessarily knowing that that thing is optimal. It's all randomness. It's pretty cool. Uh, and then a quick aside on why tuna are awesome, because tuna are amazing. I was going to make a whole video on why tuna fish are like the coolest fish as far as locomotion goes, uh, but I'll just include it as part of this locomotion lecture. So tuna can actually fold their fins down. So take a quick think back to drag. If we're trying to minimize drag, how does, you know, folding your fins into your side affect that? Well, there's less surface area that the water's hitting. If your fins are outward like this, there's water hitting those fins.
and thus you're getting more drag. You have a larger surface area. If the fins are folded into your sides, you're not increasing your surface area. So that's a cool thing that they can do. They can fold it down. They also have these little modified fins called finlets that go down the back of the fish. And you might have seen these on a tuna and wondered what the purpose of them is. Uh, and it's actually really, really interesting. So remember we talked about turbulent versus laminar flow. Uh, so the flow along the fish would, because this, you know, this dorsal fin is way up here, the flow as it went past the tuna would actually become turbulent back here and create a, a really bad pressure difference, which would make the fish's swimming much less optimal. Remember, we don't want turbulent flow. So instead, they have these little finlets along their tail, which will continue pushing the water down the body without letting it collapse onto the tail, so that the, when the water actually does finally collapse in turbulent flow, it's way behind the fish. So it's a way to maintain laminar flow along the fish, which is really cool. It's a really cool adaptation that they have that is not seen in many other things. And that's why tuna are awesome. So the next thing to talk about is the aspect ratio of a fin. So this is another way to determine uh, not so much efficiency because there's no such thing as a wrong aspect ratio of a fin. Uh, they're just used for different things. So the aspect ratio is important for determining basically how fast you can go and how quickly you can do it. Um, so it's equal to the height of the fin squared. So you can see just here the height of the fin squared. So the tuna is going to have a higher height than a, you know, a random goby divided by the surface area of the fin. And then you'll notice that the goby actually will probably have a larger surface area than the tuna will uh, ratio-wise in comparison to the height. So the tuna is going to have an aspect ratio of 7.5, a very high one. And the goby is going to have an aspect ratio of 0.6, a very low one. Uh, so a high aspect ratio will mean that they'll use less energy for swimming continuously. So the difference in aspect ratio here is really important. And you can actually tell just by aspect ratio what a, what a fish's purpose is, what they're supposed to do, and why they live the way that they do. So you'll notice tuna are well adapted for continuous swimming. Uh, and that makes sense because, you know, tuna are open water continuous swimmers. Gobies with a lower aspect ratio are much more adapted for burst swimming, which makes sense because most of the time they're sitting still. They only need to burst to catch prey or evade predators. So that makes sense that they would have a lower aspect ratio. And that's why I said neither is wrong. Having a high aspect ratio isn't wrong, nor is having a low aspect ratio wrong. Uh, they're just used for different things. So the caudal fins serve different purposes. Gobies aren't exactly intending to swim long distances. It's not their thing. So now we're going to talk about the methods of swimming. Um, so there's a lot of different methods of swimming, but the general thing that we talk about is oscillation versus undulation. And this is essentially how a fish moves its fin. So you have to stick with me here. It'll make sense, I swear, and I'll, I'll even act it out for you. Oscillating fins have 0.5 waves or less on the fin at one time. All right. So if you imagine the fin from a side view, so imagine my arm as a fin, okay? Does it reach the same peak ever along the fin, right? So my arm right now does not. If I flap my arm like this, I am oscillating my arm because there's only one peak and there's only one low, and that's it and it never, it does not go above or below that. Undulation, on the other hand, will have more than one wave at a time. So if I were to go like this, you'll notice at any given moment that I stop along this, I have peak, peak, low, and then starting to reach another low. So I have more than a single wave on the fin at that moment. So when you think of oscillation, you can think more of like a flap, a wing flap, and undulation, you can think more of like a wave. Um, of course, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's an easy way to go over it. And this is what they look like as you swim through the water. If you're undulating, you get more of this, you know, wavy fin as it moves through the water. And when you oscillate, you're thinking more of just like a back and forth, like a metronome type uh, type idea. And so now the types of swimming that different fish will adapt. This is not going to go over all the, you know, the insane types, but the general groups that fish fit into. First is the anguilliform. Uh, that should make sense. Anguilla is uh, a genus of eels. Uh, the Anguilla rostrata is the American eel. So this is found in eels, some sharks, and then the larva of other fishes. Uh, and this is where the movement is done by the trunk. So it's very maneuverable and it's quiet, but it's not particularly stable and it's not particularly fast. So eels are really good at getting into, you know, little crevices, moving themselves around. They're very quiet, uh, but they're not exactly fast, and they're not exactly stable for moving straight at a long distance, right? They're not perfectly going in a straight line uh, like a, some schooling fish you would expect. The next method is subcarangiform. 
Uh, so this is found in the Salmonids, uh, and it's more stable, and it's a little bit faster, uh, but they're losing a little bit of that maneuverability. Now, this is they're still pretty maneuverable. Keep in mind, this is still the high end of the scale of maneuverability, uh, and because the posterior half of the fish swims. So essentially, the half of the fish from the middle to the back, very back of the fish is doing the swimming. So they're a little bit less maneuverable, but they're a little bit faster, a little bit more stable. Still not very stable, still not very fast though. Now, Corangiform, this is where we're starting to get into faster fish. Uh, it's found in mackerels, for example. They're pretty stable, they're pretty fast, but they are not very maneuverable. So they're losing their maneuverability in exchange for being able to go faster in a straight line. And the most extreme of this is tuniform. Uh, so this is just the caudal peduncle and the caudal fin doing the swimming. So just this very back part of the fish here. It's extremely stable, it's extremely fast, but it has almost no maneuverability. Think about how fast a tuna can turn around. You know, their maneuverability is, is near lost. Uh, and so on some really stiff fish, the way that they'll adapt for this, like sharks, for example, a lot of the modern sharks use tuniform swimming. You know, the fast swimming sharks use tuniform swimming because uh, it is the fastest way to move. But if you don't have maneuverability, that can be, you know, a little bit of a disadvantage. So one of the ways that fish deal with this is sharks' pectoral fins are actually very, you know, very stiff, and they use them like plane wings to essentially orient themselves. Uh, and another shark, for example, the hammerhead shark, actually uses the shape of its head as a ability to maneuver itself. Uh, so basically they're adding to their maneuverability without sacrificing this tuniform method of swimming. Uh, and this chart that I've had at the left here would be good to look at. You can see how the fish moves as it moves through the water. So you see anguilliform, they're basically everywhere as they swim. This is not stable, it's not very fast. Then you'll see as you move more and more towards the more efficient swimming that they're diverging, other than their tail, uh, less and less from their path. They're going in basically a perfectly straight line uh, as things go on. So then we've got some of the, the miscellaneous, just only two that I have to talk about, I believe, uh, and that is the ostracoform uh, type of moving, which is just the oscillation of the caudal fin. So remember we talked about oscillation versus undulation. So oscillation is like this, right? So the caudal fin is oscillating, propelling the fish forward, and the entire rest of the fish's body is essentially stiff, right? So the fish is just like a stiff little ball, and then it's got a fin that's going like this. And this is not very fast. Um, it's fairly stable. It's mildly maneuverable. Um, and the pectoral fins help with that. The pectoral fins will help them go a little bit faster, help them direct themselves a little bit better. But it's not, uh, it's not the most efficient method of swimming. And you'll find this in you know, some reef fish. Uh, and then another reef fish type form of swimming you find is labriform. Uh, and this is where only the pectoral fins are oscillating, all right? So it's very distinct. It's very obvious to see. Um, my example that I think of is when I've gone snorkeling and seen parrotfish. So parrotfish will have their little pectoral fins to the side, and they swim, they go... They just, like, do little propels to propel themselves throughout the water, uh, and that's labriform. It's just the oscillation, just, the, you know, the regular up and down, non-waved uh, of the pectoral fins, and it looks very obvious. So I don't have a video for you, but you could look up a video of parrotfish swimming, and it's uh, it's pretty distinct. So that's all I have to talk about locomotion. Like I said, content-wise, it's not that intense. Um, however, math-wise, it definitely can be a little bit confusing, and this might be one of those lectures that you have to watch, you know, an extra time or two just to get a good idea of it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. Like always, I uh, I read most of the comments and try to answer questions and part nice things that people say because I really do care about this series and you know want people to be learning everything they can. I don't want you to get like hung up on aspect ratio, not fully understand it, or hung up on Reynolds number and then you know not want to take in future information. Uh, so that is all for today. I don't know what the next lecture is. I think it's reproduction. It might be reproduction. Um, either way, it should be cool and I will see you then.